Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back and thanks for joining me again. It's been a long time since I've done one of these videos and the reason for that is because I have been working on this topic for a couple of months actually. It's a controversial topic so if you disagree with me, please feel free to comment, send me an email and we can discuss. Be civil but uh, I'll, I'll respond to just about anything. Um, it's a controversial topic because today's topic is stop designing in CMYK. Now this is counterintuitive because printers are in CMYK, but I'm hoping that by the end of this, you'll understand where I'm coming from and, and maybe at least try designing in RGB instead. So let's talk about these color models. And the first color model that we're going to talk about is RGB. And those primaries are red, green, and blue. And that means that we have three channels of information in our files. And that's going to be a little bit important later on. When we mix these colors together, our secondary colors are going to be cyan, magenta, and yellow. And when we mix all three together, it's creating white. And so it's what we refer to as additive color. And that is when you add the primaries together in order to get white. Now we switch over to CMYK. In CMYK, it still only has three primaries, and those are cyan, magenta, and yellow. Black is added later, and we're going to cover that in a moment. In CMYK, though, we have four channels of information, and when we add them together, I get my secondary colors, red, green, and blue, and all three mixed together create black. So we call this subtractive color, in which case, in order to get white, we subtract all of the primaries. No ink on paper makes white paper. Now we talked about the three primaries being cyan, magenta, and yellow, so what about black? Well, theory says that cyan, magenta, and yellow added together make black. But the reality is that when we add all three of those together, generally we get kind of dark chocolate. And so we add black to the CMY mix in order to get a true black. We also add it so that if I'm just sending black type, if you know, most common type color, it's only one ink color instead of a build of three. It also helps reduce the total ink coverage in dark areas. But adding black is tricky and there are a lot of different variables. And let me switch software really fast and I'll show you what that's all about. So here we have a color management software. This is I, uh, I1 Profiler by X-Rite. Uh, it's the profiling software that I use personally and it's, it's lovely software. But what I, what I have here is if you look, I have just a, a sample image over here, uh, mostly brown, uh, and I can choose different images over here, but the brown one punctuates really what I want to show you. Um, and I've already, I've already done all of the ICC profiling process with the exception of what's called black generation, which is how, where, and how much we add black to our CMYK build. And so if I look over here, you can see I have a variety of options. So the first one here is total ink coverage, and that's important. I had mentioned before that one of the things that we do by adding black is we can lower that total ink coverage. Most uh, ink-based processes uh, really can't handle 400% total ink coverage. You can't really send it 100% each of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. So we have to dial that back a little bit so that it's just not dripping with ink or in the case of offset, dripping with water or, or some, other, some other things. There's, there's bad things that can happen uh, if I put too much ink down. So I need to dial that back and that's going to determine a lot of, of what happens in the subsequent stuff here. But if I come over here, I have black start, I have maximum black, and I have black curve. Those are really the three big ones. And I'm not necessarily going to see a difference in this file, but if I switch over to just show you this is just the black channel. Okay, so there's black information. In this file, there is right now black information. Right now, I am starting my black at 30%, which means if it's, if it's below 30% uh, darkness, right, or lightness, I should say, there's no black that's going to be added. 
And that's why like these wedges here, these wedges here have very little black. I can decrease that. And if I decrease that, you can see that everything darkened up, it added black. I can increase that and start black way late. All right, let me keep that at 50%. And I'll show you maximum black. So right now I'm saying, right now I'm saying it was at 30%, uh, that my black tops out at 100%. I can actually dial that back and say use less black. All right, so now my maximum is set to 45%. I can change my black curve and that's kind of how much black and, and, and how responsive the black is. And I can increase that. I can do a heavy black. I can do a maximum black. I can do a minimum or what we call sometimes a skeleton black. And you can see it's changing the amount of black that's in there. Right. And I can actually, if I switch over to this curve, you can really see what's happening. If I dial back the maximum, it's changing this point. If I dial up my black start or change my black start, it's changing where black actually comes in. And my black curve is changing kind of the sharpness of that curve, right? How black starts getting laid in, all right? So really the important thing here to know, it is not all of this and all of these. It's that I have all of these knobs when it comes to adding black to my CMY build. And all of those have a direct, uh, a direct effect on what the final product looks like and how it's actually built. All right, that'll be important a little bit later, but that's really, that's the gist of it here. Uh, adding black to CMY is complicated. Turning CMY to CMYK is complicated, and you absolutely do want K in there as well. You don't want to build something just with CMY. All right, I can already hear the questions, but Lee, my, my printer is CMYK. Why, why change a good thing? Why design an RGB? So there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, first of all, there's an ease of use aspect. So in Photoshop, as an example, especially older version of Photoshop, not all of your filters, your creative filters, are available in CMYK. Uh, if you look at older version of Photoshop, and there's plenty of us using those older versions, you can see that there are a lot of filters that are grayed out when I'm actually in a CMYK file. Um, secondly, here's a quick quiz. What's a good mid-tone gray in CMYK? Right? It, it depends. And wrong answers can end up giving you a non-neutral gray. So one of the really cool things about RGB, the very definition of RGB, is that as long as R, G, and B are exactly the same value, the result is a neutral gray. And that takes away all of the guesswork, right? As long as my numbers match, I get a neutral gray. Now, as far as output goes, obviously I need repeatable, uh, reliable ICC profiled output, okay? But garbage in, garbage out. If I'm not starting with good design files, then I'm really never going to get anything good for an output. Gradients tend to be smoother with less hue shifting. Um, so one of the things that you can see happen sometimes if you're designing a, with, a, with a CMYK gradient especially is... You can, you can have a gradient going from like white to black where there's portions of it that are pink, there's portion of it, of it that are green, uh, you know, maybe a little bit toward the, the blue. Um, again, as long as I have good quality output, um, I, there's, there's less of that happening. The last one that I like as far as ease of use is that generally you can get much blacker blacks by just designing 000 and letting your rip do the heavy lifting. As long as I have a rip that does good color management, giving it 000 will give you the maximum neutral density, darkest black possible on your output device. And that's really much nicer than working with a bunch of formulas. You know, I remember a time when we just had sheets and sheets and sheets of notes covering the walls behind all of our design stations that, you know, this printer on this media, this particular gray was, was this CMYK build. We don't, we don't have to do that anymore. One of the other reasons that I should design an RGB instead of CMYK is one of color gamut. 
So one of the interesting things that a lot of people don't understand, and I alluded to it at the very beginning of this, is that with digital printers, especially inkjet printers, um, the CMYK, the actual colors of cyan ink, magenta ink, um, they are different than the industry standard swap or, or, or grackle or anything like that. They're actually generally brighter, they're more vibrant, they have more color. And so if I design in CMYK, I'm designing for an industry standard that actually leaves color on the table. And I have a great demonstration of that right here. So what we have on screen here is a 3D model of the Grackle color space. And I specifically chose this because I get a lot of people uh, talking about, well, don't use swap because swap is dull and boring anyway. So I chose something, you know, this is Grackle 2006. Uh, this is a fairly vibrant uh, color space as far as CMYK goes. But what I have here, when I turn this on, what we're looking at is just a 3D model of the entire world of color that that device or, or that, that uh, profile can reproduce. What I have here, though, is uh, this is a paper product. This is Nina Image Max, which is a, a cardstock. It's a, it's a nice cardstock. And this is a middle-of-the-road print mode that I took off of my, my latex printer. Um, it, it's 110% ink density uh, on, the, on the R series, which is decent saturated color. But I can go way, way more than that if I choose to. But I wanted to show you kind of middle-of-the-road. I'm going to turn this on. Uh, and you're immediately going to see, actually, I'm going to even turn off all of these spots and lines just so that we can really see. So there is the shape um, of, of the, uh, the grackle space. And I'm going to turn on my Image Max profile. Look at that. It is bigger almost all the way around, right? This is a bigger space. All of this right here where you see mesh but you don't see a color fill on the inside. All of that is colors that I can print on Nita Image Max, but this line right here is the boundary of my design. So this, all of this shape right here is me leaving color on the table, right? All of that is color that I am cheating myself out of. Look at that. Color that I am cheating myself out of if I am designing in, in this case, Grackle, right? Swap is even considerably smaller, but if I'm designing in a, in a fairly large CMYK color space as compared to printing on Image Max. Now, let me change it up a little bit. I am going to change the Image Max and I am going to do the same thing with that. I'm gonna give that a solid shape. And now I'm going to show you what Adobe RGB 1998 looks like. That is my go-to design soft or my uh, my my design working space, my my profile. And when I turn that on, look at that. Now I have a little bit of gap here, okay? But there was also a little bit of gap right there in my grackle space. But overall, this is a shape that is much bigger than my Nina Image Max shape. So what does that mean? You know, if I'm given, if I'm given a, a very small and a very large image and I'm asked to print it at kind of the middle space between those two, I'm always going to take the larger one and make it smaller because I'm just scrunching all of my information together. If I take the smaller one and I make it larger, then what Photoshop or any other imaging software does is it adds pixels and it just makes up using an algorithm. It says, okay, if this one is 50% black and this one is 80% black, then this one in the middle is going to be 65% black. It's going to find that middle ground, that average. Color works almost exactly the same way. If I work with something smaller and want to make it bigger, and that is an option, uh, but by doing that, it's faking color information. And so I lose some nuance and I lose some tone. And just overall, I'm, I'm giving it color that I don't really have in my file. So I think that's a really good example of why 
uh, RGB has that bigger gamut. All right, the next reason that I would choose RGB over CMYK doesn't seem like it's important, but I, I kind of think it is. Uh, and that's file size. So if you remember earlier in this presentation, I said that RGB uses three channels of information and CMYK four. That immediately means that RGB files are 25% smaller in size. Now, I'm not concerned with hard drive space because, I mean, these days, hard drive space is almost free, okay? But I'm talking about time. So 25% smaller size means it takes 25% less time to save a file. It means it takes 25% less time to copy it across a network. And it means it takes 25% less time to open it in your RIP software. All right, this, this adds up. Is it a big deal? No, probably not, but it is something. Um, and and again, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving. It just gives me a little bit more overhead and I can get jobs out just a little bit quicker if I'm working in RGB. So when should I design an RGB? There's a few things. Uh, there's, a, there's a few... So the obvious question here, when should I be designing an RGB? And I have kind of five answers for you. Uh, first one is when I'm printing digitally. If I'm using a digital printer, especially an inkjet printer, um, then, then for sure uh, I can benefit from working in RGB. When I'm using non-standard inks, and by non-standard inks, I mean almost all large format inks, right? Inkjet inks. Standard in this case, I, I don't mean normal. Uh, cyan is still cyan, magenta is still magenta, but what I'm talking about is industry standard like Swap or Grackle or any similar industry standard colors. When I'm using a large gamut device. Even if I am printing digitally, if I'm going to be going to an offset press with Swap inks, there's probably no benefit to designing an RGB other than that file size thing. Um, but this, this working in RGB works best when I'm going to a digital inkjet printer. Fourth one is when I don't need to color match a commercial print. And this is really important. If I am trying to match output from a commercial offset press, as an example, I want to keep my design CMYK to match the artwork that was probably sent to the press. Most people doing press work are still sending in CMYK, right? And lastly, when I'm not outsourcing the printing, unless I know that a print provider is okay with RGB files and is good with RGB files, then I'm going to stick to CMYK in order to avoid delays if they want to contact me or surprises in the final output because they don't have good color management built into their RIP to convert RGB to CMYK. Now then, when should I design in CMYK? First, if I'm outsourcing my printed as I... Uh, now, when should I design in CMYK? First is if I'm outsourcing my printing, as I mentioned just a moment ago. Fewer surprises are likely, even if I'm leaving some potential color on the table by not using RGB. Second, if I need to match commercially printed material. Third is if I'm using customer supplied files. So if I take a CMYK file and I convert it to RGB, it doesn't give me any overhead color wise. So it's really not worth the effort except to, except to save a little time saving an opening. And that would be offset by the time it takes to make the conversion anyway. And lastly, if I'm using a low gamut printer, if my printer's gamut is similar to the CMYK diagrams we saw earlier, then keeping the CMYK is probably just fine. So wrapping it up here, except for a few circumstances, I think designing an RGB is the best option for the reasons I detailed in my video. If you disagree, I would love to hear from you. Comment below or send me a message and we can discuss. As I said, please just keep it civil. Maybe I'll change your mind. Maybe you'll change mine. Maybe we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Thank you for joining me and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.